Thank you everyone for being here this evening. I'm so happy to be invited uh, back to the Art Bar Revival and thank you Rob and Lisa and all the people who are making that happen and delighted to be reading with Stanley and Charles this evening and looking forward to the open mic. So the first poems I'll read this evening are from my book, Strip Mall Subversive, which is available for sale if anyone's interested later on. Ten dollars. Uh, okay, so this first one is called uh, Between the Houses. Rhubarb stands sentinel this spring, leafy, brave between the houses. We walk the lozenges of patio stone to where you, the stranger, fell on a pillow of wilting hostas, your body broken in the blindness of this alley. We heard the taunting, an ear horn of anger funneled to brain, our dreams strangled, gang language siphoned through spit, bangs shout, the pop of your head against the bricks of the house. We yelled out to stop the beating. Saved your life, they said. After the police, the ambulance, in the mute morning, we washed your blood from the stones, your hair from the bricks of our house. How quickly dreams are altered on that last frontier, the suburban park at midnight. Uh, our house backs on to a little uh, elementary school and uh, since the Toronto District School Board has forbidden snowball fights and probably not a bad thing, but anyway, this is called Snowball Prohibition. In the schoolyard, recess born, snow boulders press against each other like standing stones. Prevented from throwing, children roll these monsters that will never live to air. They push and grunt their Sisyphean task until the bell rings. Abandoned, hulking, the hulk colony broods in a silent circle at the soccer pitch. They long for progeny, for small white comets that bear no malice, just wish to be formed in frozen mittens delivered by tiny hands. <laughs> Anyway, we are the child poverty capital of Canada. I think that's a shameful thing that Toronto has that new designation. This is a poem that I wrote about um, an after-school arts program in Scarborough called Drama Class at the Disco. We house it in an old motel on four lanes that lead to Toronto where homeless families shelter in these 1950s motels, often five to a room with a grill from Walmart. Our incentive is a snack, and it works. Kids lope across the parking lot to an abandoned disco where we've set up a drama class. But after school arts can only go so far when a sandwich goes further. A seven-year-old playing a king asks me if he can have a real throne and he points to a pile at the back of the room where his mother's furniture awaits a home. We drag its humbleness into the palace. His face, alight with familiarity, shines brighter than his crown. And in his mom's armchair, hope attends him. Thank you. Uh, this is an ekphrastic poem uh, based on a sculpture by Tony Craig that's in the National Gallery, and it's sort of shaped like a heart. It's called A Place in My Heart, and it was covered with dice. Forms. Like ventricles or an inner vacuum, heartless. I hear a child speak through a valve. His father listens through sculpture, part cactus, part scrotum chair, all to chance dice-covered some not so pearly. How age takes over life's detritus, board games shuffled into closets, misplaced cards, abandoned chances, Hemingway's racing papers, random dice spilled like old teeth on the floor. I 
grew up on the St. Lawrence River, which I really love, and I love that landscape. And um, this is a, a poem about what happens at night on the St. Lawrence and the International Shipping Channel. It's called Freighter. It's an MRI, or maybe a train. Her engines grind full out with the clang bang that wakes you. Rusty hull, Liberian flag at her stern. 2.30 a.m. The St. Lawrence still, but for the loons and the pounding of this wreck of a ship, breaking all the rules, speeding to the lakehead, defecating mussels and enemy fish while the Coast Guard sleeps. July slaps her weed mat against the shore as the seaway spins her ships up and down this liquid abacus. Her retreat foments escape fantasies. You listen as her huge wake damages docks while a thousand islands absorb her. Slumber has its own cargo. There are strangers out there asleep as they pass your house, and maybe one or two, like you, awake. Good, we'll get it later, okay. Uh, I'm going to read just, uh, thank you so much, thanks. Um, I think I might want to just, yeah. So uh, this is some new work that I'm really um, delighted to read this evening because I haven't had a, a lot of chances to read my new work. So thank you very much. This is from my second book that's on the way. Sea fans. They come burling through waves sea ravaged, lifting up like kite surfers in the molasses of night, feathering down on roofs, on balconies with a clump of root, like hair ripped from brains of coral. Washed up, sun-baked, lacy as black mantillas, they litter the shore of Women's Bay, a grief-strewn boudoir of sea widow's weeds. Stirred by the trade wind, sea fans lift and drop like women's eyes, some kind of seduction, and the sea herself saying, give over. I send you Maybelline lashes, but I take your men. <laughs> I'm sort of doing a series about trees and woodlots and um, in particular, my grandfather lived in Prince Edward County, and I spent a lot of time in the woods there, and I'm kind of revisiting that. So this is called um, Picton Woodlot. What's unspoken when the tongues of trees are in their roots, deep in what humus conceals? Shells, bones of beloved dogs, shards of meteor. Snow shields the breath of trillium, the silent wonder of hepatica. Quinty sky, fog light pale behind the constellation of pine, and winter's vertebrae in branches stark as bone in the dark months. There is knowledge in these woods, brilliant as the meteors pounce, in every woodlot a secret, where mother cedar inverts root language, calls our names. Fallen cedar. Alligatored on the woodlot floor, your ever-glade eye watches as your wisdom etches air. Free to grow old, no saw quartered you for fences or stunted you into an embarrassment of posts. Nor were you cut down in your prime, cedars stripped for a bay skimming canoe. You observe the complications of the woodlot, your roots political and deep, as young trees fought for light. Your forest matured, as all things do. Saplings nudged you to move on. And so, with the havoc of vines, your tangled life took you down to comfort insects in winter, where your speechless weight works magic with leaf mold and moss. Can I just have a little? I Thank you. Tree frog. 
Rarely seen outside the breeding season, he clings hard to the surface of our car, a green lollipop with skin that looks dissolvable like pond scum, yellow underthighs like Malvolio, his froggy eyes bright with anticipation. Maybe he just wants to get away from the eggs and the wife and all the family duties. <laughs> Forget the trees for a while. So we drive him into town that Saturday where he might have hopped off for a latte at the bookstore. But we find him later, flowered with dust from county roads, still adhered to the track, like some amphibian hobo reluctant to go home, the hot metal silencing his flute-like trill. So I have some winter poems I'm going to read just near the end here, and um, I hope I'm not going to bring it on or anything, because we're loving this weather, right? But I do have that, you know, thinking of those, like the ice storm where we didn't have power for nine days in Scarborough, that kind of thing. Anyway, so this is called Winter Nocturne. A spill of moon ice on the field where ski tracks gleam like snail gloss. Small journeys pressed to white memory as through the open door, I strain to hear the sound. Down over the cliff, half mammal, half bird. Coyote or the bleat of swans, whatever it is, calls to me in the dark of this mean winter. Bewitched by sound, I fly moonlit, winged like a snow goose over the wild perilous, above damaged arms of willow and famished deer to the cry in that night, feeling lonely but welcomed, part human, part wild witness. Green lightning powers out, fireside and underprepared, we burn logs of pressed sawdust. As lightning cartoons the sky, a riotous lime, Power lines shudder with ice so heavy, branches of sumac ache with the white. We eat meals of eggs, porch cooked with a camp stove, lumber slowly in our ski pants, silent as characters in a Swedish film, and carry our uncharged phones like talismans in bleak interiors leaching heat. This thunder snow above the lake has a depth of wind shear that tears the commonplace, batters us to a different purpose. We are stopping, conductive. We stumble into conversations, tentative in this stretch of peace and silence we would normally ignore. The darkness richer now, and our connections stranded out in talk. Okay, just uh, two more. This is uh, called Red Dragonfly Tea. A done day, sunny, end of October, home from work on the garden bench. Sip tea as a red dragonfly sweeps into my cup. Over my outstretched lip, I watch her writhing in Irish tea, red eyes bulbous, pleading, while I splash her out on grass best chance she might survive. Stunned minutes stretch, and then a red dragonfly lands on my arm, startles, flies away, lands again, over and over, lifts and settles, our eyes meet, thanking me, I think. Now some might see a message in this revisiting, some urge for balance or spirit life, but my toss was not benign. I rise to see the drowned companion staring up at me, eyes sodden, red stick back nestled in grass, her gossamer steeped as the sun burned down. Thank you very much. Um, this poem I wrote uh, coming home one day after work and seeing the lake frothing and foaming and the day I saw the water spouts was cold, the lake white with sea smoke, but something was happening out there. 
columns of steam in a vertical stretch, spinning like the funnel from the Wizard of Oz, their pale magic twitched across the lake, chased by steam devils, whose diaphanous arms reached up from waves and disappeared as the towering spouts reached cloud height. I felt taller myself, a giddy witness, bewitched by arctic wind shear that set those tubes pirouetting. Grappling with this wild winter dance that felt Shakespearean like a portent, I could not look away. I knew my camera could not hold this devilry. No lens could freeze frame such rapid choreography of cloud, shape, and wonder. Thank you, everybody. And this is my last one. Um, my husband, Mark, who's over there in the corner there, we were um, out in our kayaks. <laughs> Hello, Mark. Um, <laughs> kayaking over an old wreck off the, uh, sort of off the beach in Scarborough East a bit, <clears throat> near the Doris McCarthy Trail, actually. And it was a paddle wheeler called the Alexandria. And we just happened to be on this very, very calm day where there was no like no ripple. You could actually see right down to the wreck. So this is the wreck of the Alexandria, which happened in August 1915. Our kayaks hug shore as the great lake stretches a silky calm. Flagged by gull perch, we paddle to the wreck's old boiler, a beer bottle toss from shore. Shadow floating above the Alexandria, we peer down her funnel, furred green like an old volcano thrust up from her struts and steam pipes in a chaos of decking and rails. We squint for her paddle wheels, those fluted crinolines long gone, storm smashed on Scarborough shore. Bound for Toronto, tomatoes and vinegar, barrels of sugar, all salvaged, salvaged by rescuers heeding her call. That rain lashed night on Kingston Road, a landlady made up 22 beds for the men who survived. The metal-hungry war took the scrap. Not much left to see as we float above this weedy museum. A hundred years later, on a silent morning in August, her soundtrack and shouts held in water. Thank you. Thank you.